bubbles in the air. People, <clears throat> welcome back to Place of Assembly. This is Sam Hilmer, your host. Place of Assembly is produced by Hollow NYC here in New York in partnership with Experimental Sound Studio Chicago and 8-Ball Radio. Uh, took February off to get the next series together. Uh, hope everybody's been as well as possible, staying safe and staying warm. It's been cold AF and really snowy where I am. Um, we've got an exciting series coming up for you. Next 15 episodes. Uh, keep them up online, hollow.nyc forward slash podcast. They're all there to check out. Um, we're going to be doing a focus on geographic locations throughout the series. We're looking at upstate New York first. That begins next week, four episodes. And then we have a three-episode bit on China and a three-episode bit on Eastern Europe. We have a two-episode joint on Is the Internet a Real Place? So uh, big things, big things um, coming on Plays of Assembly. Uh, hope you will join us. Today on the show, we have John Corbett, um, really, really deep character, uh, wears many hats, uh, curator, event space worker, gallery head, label head, teacher, writer. He's written extensively on improvised music, um, has done extensive work on and with Sun Ra. Um, really heavy character. Excited to get into this conversation. So check it. What's up? Hey, hey. How's it going? Pretty good, man. How are you? Doing well. Um, good, man. So, John Corbett, welcome to, uh, am I saying your name correctly? Am I putting the accent in the right place? Um, I always say John Corbett, but... Uh, no, so. Well, you know, you're the authority. John yeah. Corbett. Okay, Bet. Well, welcome to uh, Place of Assembly. Thanks. Thanks. Great to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm. this is uh, the first episode of a new series. I'm kind of understanding these things in terms of series that, you know, in my mind have some kind of arc or something um but i'm trying some new things so so one one thing is a is, is a new opener um just so you know i feel like in these things people get into this like so tell me about yourself and blah 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 which we will do but um it can be a little dry you know like right off rip so uh i i, I have an idea and that is that um i'm gonna ask everybody to tell me let's well, see now i'm giving it away but whatever i'm gonna ask everybody to tell me uh what, what's the most insane or crazy or you know ecstatic or problematic uh, event you've ever been a part of let's say where you had some type of role you know what i mean you weren't just there you had some responsibility of some kind boy uh that's a tough one, but because I've, I've been fortunate to uh, be involved in a lot of wonderful, crazy things. I, I think one of the things that was uh, about as wonderful and crazy uh, a situation as I can imagine was uh, being asked to put together an evening of performance at the Guggenheim on the occasion of Christopher Wool's show there uh, must have been 2013 or so. And we uh, organized, I organized an evening of music and performance with um, Richard Hell reading, uh, Arto Lindsay performing solo and The Thing, the group, the power trio uh, from Scandinavia, The Thing with Joe McPhee playing. Whoa. And Mike Gustafson sort of led things off in the, <clears throat> in the spiral uh, of the, the Guggenheim. Kind of everybody was gathered for drinks downstairs in the lobby and then 
Mott's started playing solo baritone saxophone walking down the corkscrew and he came down and it was so it's a very reverberant space so it was just this unbelievable racket and uh, incredible ringing sound and of course everybody shut up and watched and listened and uh, that was an amazing that was an amazing event but I've been really blessed to be part of a lot of different um, events that I feel uh, uh, that were at the time pretty extraordinary so you know I remember when that event happened because that's right around the time that I met Ardo who um, is a close friend and also I'm fortunate to say collaborator of mine and he had just done that no wait a minute wait a minute no, I, I met Ardo for the first time kind of significantly before that, but I, I, but I, but I started kind of rolling with Ardo like right off the back of that thing. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I remember thinking, wow, that, that sounds like a cool thing. So that was you. So respect. Congratulations on that. Thanks. Yeah, it was fun. It was really an amazing evening. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no doubt. You know, uh, we, you know, um, Organizing events has been a major part of my life. So, um, and you put everything you've got into into putting things together, and and sometimes they really work in a way that transcends anything you could imagine. Um, and uh, and sometimes, you know, I almost the answer could have been like uh, one of the worst moments of presenting, okay. uh, which would have been. Uh, you know, Ken Vandermark and I organized a, a nine different festivals uh, under the banner of the Empty Bottle um, Festival of Jazz and Improvised Music. And one of the ones that we did, we invited this group called Los, uh, which was Peter Van Bergen's group from from um, Holland, mm -hmm. from Hague. And they came and it was an expanded version of the group. So I think it was about six people and they had this crazy backline. They wanted all of this different stuff, all crazy, amazing equipment. And they were to perform on the Sunday of the festival. And uh, in their backline was a, uh, was a uh, uh, Celeste. And, um, we got there, you know, we got to the, we, we got there and the box for the Celeste was there and there wasn't a Celeste in it. And it's Sunday about 45 minutes before the concert. And they're like, we can't do the music that we brought without the Celeste. And I managed to find us a Celeste. Whoa. In 45 minutes on a Sunday. For the concert and that That's was insane. that was really you know you talk about bust a blood vessel kind of moments that was sure. definitely one of the one of those well that first of all respect for scaring up a celeste like that that's pretty crazy i mean not to be on some like new york centric vibe but like even in new york that would be hard to to do you know i mean new york you know they're ready for things like this to happen you know like people have celeste on hand and whatnot but 45 minutes like damn um and, uh, you know, there's a thing that people say, which is that, uh, or I've heard said, which is that event-based work is the highest stress work next to the job where you're the guy on the runway with those lights. <laughs> now, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if anybody actually did a study or something. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But this is, that's something that I've heard said more than once. And I believe it. It is incredibly high stress. So, um, and, and so I, I read in the thing that you sent me, um, can you actually just tell us on air, like what that is? It's an introduction to something like, yeah, there's a, there's a, a uh, an academic book coming out. That's a collection of essays, uh, around improvisation and transnational culture. And, uh, they invited me to write the, um, basically the preface for it, uh, which is, um, and, and it's a book that's looking at improvisation through all different lenses, but largely through a, a contemporary ethnomusicological lens. But I looked at it from the standpoint of someone presenting music and the experiences that I've had, how that put me in all sorts of transcultural uh, circumstances and, and what kind of a learning 
curve do you have as someone who's really interested in presenting music from around the world um, in your hometown, wherever that happens to be at any given moment? Um, and kind of what the, the, the fact that that in itself presents uh, a place where cultures clash and um, meld and all sorts of different things happen on the level of uh, cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. Bet. Okay, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to deep dive on that. But I read in that, in that introduction that you began your event-based career at Brown University. And what I want to ask is, do you, do you have moments where you're like, man, I am done with this, but I'm like, I'm out of the events game. And, and uh, if you do, what keeps you in the game? And if you don't, what's your secret? Because I certainly have those moments. Well, I had that moment in a big way, and I followed that moment uh, and got out of it, really, in, in the sense that I'm not presenting regular events anymore. I mean, we do uh, irregular performances at my gallery, Corbett versus Dempsey. Um, Jim Dempsey and I organize different kinds of music there, sometimes readings, sometimes different kinds of things. But uh, it is a space where we um, make an opportunity for uh, performances to happen, but it isn't regular. And the thing that I found incredibly stressful about presenting music regularly was the fact that you could be standing there watching some music that you'd put a, an enormous amount of effort into getting there. And all you're thinking about is, where am I going to get a drum kit for next week's show? Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of rolling stress of uh, wondering about money, wondering about uh, backline, wondering about all of those things. Um, that was what really, ultimately, I said, I've got to get out of this. And being the last guy uh, at the club at four o'clock in the morning, two thirds of the way uh, drunk, uh, counting money, that was, you know, taking its toll. And eventually I was sort of like, I really don't want to do that three times a week anymore. Mm -hmm. And so how long ago was that, that you had that like, okay, like when moment? Right around the time, so there was a, a cluster of events. So for me, you know, the pinnacle of the presentational uh, world in a way for me was um, being invited to be artistic director of the Berlin Jazz Festival in 2002. So in 2002, I did that. We were still really hip deep in the Empty Bottle series and the Empty Bottle festivals. So we had a weekly series and we had an annual festival that was very ambitious. Um, and that was about the time that I began to feel burned out on presenting in that kind of regular way. Uh, and then in 2004, we opened Corbett versus Dempsey. And that was, I saw that as a bit of a pivot for me in a way where I, okay, now I'm not gonna be at the clubs presenting music that way. I'm shifting my attention to another, you know, long-term passion of mine, which has to do with the visual arts here in Chicago and visual art more generally. And um, which is a, less of a uh, nocturnal um, activity. <laughs> and so my whole lifestyle changed right at that point. And I thought in some ways, maybe I have moved outside of, musical, my, the, my engagement in music is going to um, diminish here. And it did for a little while while we were setting up the gallery, um, but it did not in the long run. I, I got, and I'm more involved in uh, production of records and in select concert uh, production than I ever have been. So I'm very happy with the decisions that came out of that but it was definitely like it was definitely a moment where i said i can't do this mm -hmm. regularly anymore yeah you know i mean i run a, a club in new york called hollow uh h zero l zero and um <clears throat> i i'm not like it's not like the plan that i'm on the guy i'm the guy on the floor at 4 a.m do you know what i mean but it happens enough you know what i mean it happens 
one to three times a week, it ends up happening. You know what I mean? Um, and this time getting out of that work has definitely led me to a commitment to not be that guy basically ever. Like if I am up at the club at night, it's to come see an artist, come catch a set, have a beer and go home. It's not to ride this thing out till, you know, we lock the door. You know what I mean? Yep. That said, there is something about after the spot is shut down, who's still there? People are smoking inside. I don't know if y'all can do that in Chicago, but we can't do that in New York. Now you can't smoke inside Chicago anymore, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's like the door is long. People are smoking inside. The staff's hanging out with the musicians. Some of the musicians are still there. Drinks are on the house. Those hangs, man. I mean, those are, I mean, yes or no. Those are pretty sick hangs, right? They're essential. And they were uh, one of the deepest parts of my education, for sure. And I would not have traded them for anything. But I also recognize they're going to kill me. I mean, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, no, I mean, I have, I, 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 I love them. I mean, I love that whole, the, the, and it's an honor to be engaged in that way and in that level. I, you, you can't take that for granted. Yeah. Um, but, but by the same token, you have to recognize your, your own physical limits, your body's limits, mm -hmm. your mind's limits, you know, and, uh, and for me, it was a matter of like finding a way to try to do like sustain what I was doing. And I think sustain uh, the question of, of, of being able to sustain it was, a, was, was what really led me to want to shift things around mm -hmm. and to want to make a real change. Yeah. Uh, I, it, for me, it was the same thing with teaching, you know, like I, I'm not teaching anymore. I taught at the school of the art Institute for almost 30 years and I'm not teaching anymore in part because it took a crazy toll on me because I give everything. If I get into a teaching context, I'm sure my blood pressure is running like insanely high the whole time. I'm on like hyperdrive while I'm doing it. And I, I couldn't find ways to modulate that. And in the long run, I just realized, you know, given that I'm doing all of these other things, I've got to just bow out of doing that, which was very hard. I love teaching. I love the engagement with students. But it's, it's similar. It's like you have to, I had to listen to myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to begin to listen to myself because, you know, that was a very distant, um, a distant bell for me. And I didn't really want to recognize it. Like, oh, I might actually have to stop doing this. Like, what? You're going to stop doing it right at the moment that all of these amazing opportunities are coming along? Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. No, I, I feel you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely... Uh, not with teaching. I haven't, I have taught a lot in my life, but I haven't been doing that in the last couple years very much or last number of years, maybe five years. But, um, but uh, with the, the being out till 4am, it's got, it's got to stop, man. It, it's like, it's not as much as, as much as I think we agree that that moment after the door is locked and who's, who just, who, the people who come, after the thing is over that you unlock the door and let in like that whole thing you know is is brilliant and i've yeah I, I agree with you it's been an honor to be a part of that and uh have made so many of those hangs but uh yeah you know you got to slide over let somebody else do that at, an, at some point anyway but um but yeah yeah you you do that stuff a couple times a week it's like your whole week is shot you know what i mean you're like you can't function you know what i mean anyways enough about this but um so let's get into okay i want to we 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 when we talked about the introduction to that book we talked um a little bit about the you know cross cultural collaborate collaborative stuff and i want to i want to like scuba dive on that but before we do that g give me uh give me like the lowdown on just you know who john corbett is and like how you came to this and whatnot you know we Oh, uh, 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 because I provide music, and I was, you know, uh, a about maybe eleven or twelve or so, and um, uh, 
when I was in high school, I had a friend who knew a lot about jazz who ended up being very influential on me just by basically opening up the jazz section of the record store to me, like basically saying, convincing me that it was not as daunting as I felt it was because I knew all of the names in the other sections of the record store, but I didn't know anything in jazz. And he just encouraged me to just dive in and start running around in it. And I did. And that led me, I mean, that really, my interest in it came out of punk, I think. Uh, I was, and I, I found a similar energy, uh, you know, buying records by like James Blood Ulmer, for instance, and finding a kind of similar energy uh, to what attracted me to punk and no wave, um, and especially post-punk at that time. So, um, so by the time I went to college, I was pretty deep into that stuff. Um, and in college, right out of the gate, I began running with people who were organizing concerts. And that was a that was, uh, I apprenticed with them. I was a gopher for a couple of years and sort of gradually began to do more central things with those people who were organizing these concerts. And they were all a little older than me. And then they left. And when they left, I took over. And so I spent a year organizing concerts uh, at Brown. And when I did that, I decided I was going to form a not-for-profit. So I did. Um, I did that in Providence, which allowed me to get a little bit of money to support what I was doing. And then I moved to Boston for a year and I took the organization with me to Boston or I kind of restarted it there. And, uh, um, and that, you know, I was there for a year and then moved to Chicago and I had already established contact with people who were organizing concerts here. Um, so when I came out here, I was I hooked up immediately with um, people who had started something. They came out of Lynx Hall, which was a very important series of concert concerts. It was a venue here that was organized by the drummer Michael Zerang um, in collaboration with a, a guy named Leo Krumpholz, who was not a musician. And Leo broke away and started his own place called South End Music Works. So starting to talk about venues and talking about kind of places of assembly. Uh, for me, you know, coming to Chicago in 1987, those were the places uh, I spent a lot of time in, in Lynx Hall and in Lower Lynx, which opened right around then. Um, but the place that I really worked and I affiliated myself with was uh, South End Music Works. And I began helping organize concerts there and using some of my contacts, having organized especially events with musicians from Europe, uh, bringing some U European musicians into, the, um, into their uh, program. Um, and they were already doing that a little bit, but I definitely kind of upped the ante on that. And then uh, um, I started doing a lot of independent production over the course of the next few years um, until 1996, when Ken Vandermark and I started doing the um, Empty Bottle series. So, and, and that ran for almost a decade and included nine festivals and uh, weekly concerts for almost 10 years. Um, and that was really, you know, that, with peppered with a variety of, I, when I was doing independent production, I was doing it all over town. And I've had opportunities to organize concerts elsewhere here and there. But you know, my interest in improvised music has always, I felt like I was best served by having, by having a foot in different worlds. So I've written about it extensively since the beginning. For a good long time, I played it quite seriously, although I don't do that now for a lot of reasons. Um, and I've been involved as a producer and as a, um, and as a presenter. And I feel like each different part of that has informed my overall view of what it means to improvise, of what 
the diff what different things are at stake in in playing improvised music um, and what a lot of the um, kind of politics of it are. So, you know, that's maybe my, that's a nutshell version of my engagement with improvisation, although, you know, it goes many, many different directions, but that's sort of like the arc of it. Mm -hmm. Got you. Um, I want to zero in on, on uh, something that you said really just out of some like, kind of like fanboy energy, because, <clears throat> but this is a, it, this puts a light on how a space can like emanate, you know what I mean? Um, I got into the Chicago kind of indie based scene. Like my great weird music awakening was freshman year of high school, older dude that I rolled with, put me onto Zorn, put me onto Kronos Quartet and put me onto Gaster Del Sol. Yeah. So between Zorn, Kronos Quartet and Thrill Jockey, it was like, you know what I mean? Like, it just opened on to like everything else. You know what I mean? That was, those were really good roadmaps to kind of just find your, so it's like Zorn, Spy vs. Spy, Ornette Coleman, Ornette Coleman, right from there, you know, like James Blood Ulmer, all that stuff came and and in and, and with uh, Kronos, the kind of new music lane and with, and I was, I grew up in DC. So I had the DC, that was all happening in the context of the DC punk thing, which, you know, opened up at the time there was the kind of Neo No Wave thing happening. And so Ardo and James Chance and Lydia Lunch, all that stuff. It was all at once, right? But one space that I was really um, preoccupied by was, uh, was the empty bottle. Because with, with the way that the Chicago scene was kind of starting to hit at that time and the way that it continued to kind of creep into the awareness of people. This would have been like 93 that this was happening. So now over like 93, 94, 95, 96 with the success of bands like Tortoise and Sea and Cake and such, right? You started to have, this is pre-internet, right? So you start to have these little sort of morsels of awareness of, oh, there's this place, the empty bottle. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. like, I remember hearing that there, they had a night there where, where cats from the scene would just come and play a whole record or something like this. Maybe that's made up. I don't know, but I heard no, it at one point. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and one of the things about it, it kind of occupied an analogous um, place in that scene that the Knitting Factory seemed to me at the time as in my high school brain coming from DC to occupy in New York, where there was this kind of cool thing happening where there were these bands that were kind of relatable to the punk bands that I was interested in and that I would play with and whatnot in DC, but that seemed to have this cross pollination happening with people like Ken Vandermark and other players, um, you know, from the from the jazz and improvised music related scene. And it, I kind of pieced together that maybe these people all met up at this place called the Empty Bottle. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But right. it was very, it was like mythic to me. Do you know what I mean? I was like, I'm trying to imagine this place, you know, and eventually I've played the empty bottle many times now and it's, and it actually was stunning and an incredible experience. It kind of lived up to what I hoped it would be. But um, I don't know, that's, that's interesting, but you were a part of that. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think I was, I was, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I was pretty central part of the, certainly the jazz and improvised music side of that, uh, you know, Ken and I booked that whole series, uh, and um, it, you know, just it's so interesting because from outside the um, to think about it from what it meant outside of Chicago. I mean, one of our one of our big aims was really like there's a, an incredible wealth of of musicians here and legacy here, and you know. Um, and there was a time when a lot of attention was trained on Chicago. Periodically, there have been these kind of like attention on Chicago, Chicago jazz, like Chicago improvised music, Chicago creative music, you know. Ironically, you know, even in the, in the, in the previous version of that from the one that I was engaged it with, which would have been in the 70s, let's say, um, ironically, those musicians who we associate with that an awful lot of them weren't living in Chicago by the time everyone was talking about them as Chicago like the art ensemble of Chicago uh who this painting is this was on the cover of urban urban bushman 
Um, the Art Ensemble of Chicago, most of them were not living in Chicago by the time everyone was talking about them as Chicago. And so Chicago suddenly got this reputation in part, you know, because of people who were no longer living here. Um, but that faded eventually when those people weren't living here anymore. And that didn't make sense to be talking about as rich a scene here as, uh, as it, you know, as people wanted it to be. Um, and then in the, in the 90s, again, this kind of thing came up where people were talking about Chicago again and from outside of Chicago in a way um, constructing a myth about Chicago in the best sense of what it was in the most attractive sense, people start coming to Chicago, moving here to you know, set things up, uh, to get involved in this obviously amazing scene. Um, and I'll tell you a funny story from one of the, probably I think it was the third Empty Bottle Jazz and Improvised Music festivals. Um, because you know, the Empty Bottle is a bar, it's a straight up bar. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm there, we were packed. It was like 400 people at the bottle for the festival. I don't remember who was playing, but I'm, in, I'm inside trying to kind of like organize various aspects of the, um, of the stage. And uh, suddenly, there's a problem out front and uh bruce finkelman whose bar it is mm -hmm. comes up yeah. you know, comes up to me at the at the front of the and he says got a little bit of a problem up here and i'm like okay so we walk up to the front and there's these two kids basically really young probably like 16 years old and they're outside and the woman's crying and her boyfriend's you know like really really distraught and bruce says they came from Switzerland and I'm like oh. holy shit are you kidding me it's like they found out about the festival they came from Switzerland but they're like 16 years old I can't let them in <laughs> and, and I'm like man we got to find a way they came from Switzerland there's no way we cannot not let them in so we, we figured out a way to like put these armbands on them and mark them in a way that they couldn't possibly, you know, uh, and to assign them chaperones and whatever. And then they got to come in and watch the music. That's um, sick, man. I was, I was really worried that that story was going to just be like, and they couldn't, and they couldn't figure that away. I was like, uh, if we have to have the music outside, we've got to do it. They have to be able to see it. They came all this way. It was so cool. Okay. Well, while we're at this, check this out. I, I, I work, across a lot of different stylistic verticals, okay? So my, my establishment and the one that I ran previously is kind of like difficult listening by day and like turned up off the rails nightlife by night. You know what I mean? It's kind of the deal, you know? It's a common model. Um, <clears throat> so I tend to do programming for Art Basel not the actual Art Basel Fair itself, but Art Week, Miami Art Week, right? Um, for the other fairs. Um, and we, I was working with Le Poisson Rouge in New York, who I imagine you, you know, you probably know Bryce, right? Um, Winter Jazz Fest and so forth, you know? Yeah. Anyways, um, I was working with Bryce and Le Poisson Rouge. Oh, I wonder if he's gonna, anyways, who cares? Um, <laughs> you'll see where I'm going with this. And we, Bryce wanted to book this rapper from Chicago name um cupcake and i had done cupcake at my old club transpicos as part of a night put on by this crew mix pack who's a label that does present day dance hall artists like vibes cartel and popcon and Ch ching ching and things like this um and it was uh you know those parties were always really turned up but it was there was nothing specifically problematic about it i had no reason in my mind to be particularly concerned about doing cupcake so cupcake was being booked as the um the live act on a dj night that was powering a vogue ball at a dive bar in north beach miami beach okay so this is already a a pretty spicy situation okay now what i didn't realize was that in <clears throat> in the two years since i had booked cupcake Cupcake had blown up on in the kind of Tumblr Instagram universe 
and had tens of thousands of fans that were age, ages 14 to 18, okay? <laughs> this was news to me. I did not know this. Now, it wasn't my idea to book the artist, but I'd done it before. I figured this is not going to be a problem. So we booked, we booked Cupcake. But what had happened was we, had, we were going to do it at a hotel, but it immediately became apparent that the hotel location was going to be a problem. So we moved the event from the hotel to the dive bar because the dive bar was going to be more tolerant of the antics and was happy to have the business, right? Um, that proved to be its own problem. I'll tell you about that later. But um, the problem with the dive bar was that the dive bar was 21 plus. Now I had cleared with the guy, like, look, there might be some people who are 18. We'll put wristbands on them, X's on their hands, you know, blah, blah, blah. He said, okay, that's fine. I said, okay. So, but, but it becomes clear about two hours before this thing starts, 14 to 18 year olds start showing up to this thing in packs, like two hours early. And you know, they're 14 to 18, they don't have any money, they don't have anywhere to go. So they just wanna sit in front of the venue and the guy at the, at the bar gets a load of this and he's like, dude, this cannot happen. Like I, I, you said a few people already, it's 9 p.m. We've got 20, 30 kids out here, like absolutely not, right? So then we're trying to figure this out. Cupcake is saying she won't go on if her fans can't see her. So what we did to resolve this and what, what made me think of this is what you said about perform outside or something, was we set up the sound system and the mic so that Cupcake would play in the doorway. And everybody who was 21 plus on the inside would watch from one side. And then all of these kids would watch the concert on the street from the other side. And so, Brilliant. You know, there were literally 300 kids on the street and and some of them with their parents you know and i was responsible for this thing and i just felt like oh my god i have a kid i just felt like oh this is what have i gotten myself into and uh the other thing to know about cupcakes content is that it's basically verbally it's pornographic i mean it's like extremely lewd right so the set was about 20 minutes, thank God. So during that time, there were 314 to 18 year olds who knew every word to these songs, chanting these pornographic lyrics with these like random parents standing around on the street in Miami. And uh, I was just out of my mind worried about this. And then after that, we had, I had to line them all up for a photo shoot, for a photo opportunity with Cupcake. So I got all 300 of these kids in a single file line and we walked them around the corner so they wouldn't be in front of the club and they were in front of like a CVS uh, around the corner. And as soon as we accomplished that, the cops came and there was nothing going on. So that was, that was uh, that's my, my most recent run-in. And that's, my, that's probably the craziest event I've ever been a part of. That's, that's, that's good, that's pretty nuts. Anyhow, back to the empty bottle. But um, what was that? How, how do you feel that, like you're on the, you were saying you were doing the weekly on the jazz side of it. What, what was, because what, now again, I wasn't there, correct me if I'm wrong. What was that cross pollinating energy like between the jazz communities and, um, and these kind of interloping indie rockers that got involved and then some of those musicians would play in their band or be on their records and whatnot. Like, how did that find expression? Was there something about the bottle and their vision or energy that specifically facilitated and enabled that? And were they welcome? Like, what, what, just describe that. You know, I'll describe it from two vantages. I'll describe it from my, our vantage, from a producerly vantage and from like the, the venue vantage. So from my vantage, the thing, I think from the, well, let me go the other way, that from the venue vantage, I think they had a, a Wednesday night that was always a dud. They didn't know what to do to try to get people in on a Wednesday night, you know? So they tried a number of different things. Nothing seemed to work. Why not try this? It can't be worse than the things that we've already done. Sure, yeah. And uh, so they invited uh, Ken and me to do it. And, um, and from our standpoint, you know, I'd, I'd been actively thinking about this for a while. And I know Ken had too, because Ken, before this, I think in like 94, 
you know, Ken had done a number of events where he and his band, the Van Mark Five or the Van Mark Quartet at the time, would play a double bill with um, Fred Anderson Trio, for instance, at Lounge Axe, which was another great Chicago rock venue. And, um, and they were very successful evenings. Um, and what came out of that was a better understanding that like, okay, the, the obstacle here is that there's all of this interest from young, young folks about jazz. They've been listening to Coltrane. They've been listening to, you know, they're getting into it in one way or another. And they hear about free jazz. They hear about improvised music, but they really, they, and they want, they're curious. They're improvised curious but they're not comfortable going to the jazz clubs because to them, the jazz clubs are their parents' venue uh -huh. or even their grandparents' venue. They're not comfortable with that. They feel really awkward there. So if we took those two things and we put that music into a venue mm -hmm. that they felt comfortable in, suddenly they're okay. And not only that, they're riveted. They're totally fascinated by it. And that gamble that we took I mean the third concert we did in our series was the first time Joe McPhee ever played in Chicago and we had 240 people at the club on a Wednesday night starting at 10 o'clock that was we all looked we looked at each other and said we could make this work this could actually fly and the first time we presented the Peter Brotzman at that time it was an octet at the empty bottle we had, a, we had a more than full house. We had more than 400 people in that venue. And you, you've played that venue. You know, it's a, that's a very, very packed empty bottle. Sure. And, uh, you know, that, those kinds of experiences, having that rock-like energy, that energy uh, of a kind of, uh, of a, uh, a rock venue energy, but with that music, for me, that was very galvanizing. I mean, it meant we could do anything. And when Joe McPhee played, he was playing on that stage, unamplified. They, he wanted to go without any amplification, playing basically like mouth sounds on the trumpet, like just like, it was dead silent. You could have heard it across the street. And it was incredible because we realized, you know, and that wasn't always the case. You had people standing at the bar, you know, we did Thurston, we had Thurston Moore at one of the festivals and a whole bunch of Thurston fans came and they sat at the bar talking the whole time while we had other things going on that required more attention. So it wasn't always successful, that mm -hmm. merger, that kind of symbiosis that you're alluding to wasn't always successful, but when it was, you could just see light bulbs going off around the room. You could, you could feel people being turned on by it. Mm -hmm. And they weren't necessarily people who were gonna be turned on and then lifelong fans. Mm -hmm. They were, they, and which is totally fine. That was also something I learned from it, which was, you're not, it's not necessarily about becoming a convert, <clears throat> right? Like it's mm -hmm. about creating a great event and creating something that maybe even in an ephemeral way, um, give something to someone to think about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, that, it, it, it got me away from really thinking about, well, we've got to, you know, we've got to get, got to turn people on. It is, but that can last for however long it needs to last. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're talking about something that I feel really strongly about, which is that when you, when you're doing this thing where you're you're kind of rehoming something somewhere uh partially in the hopes that you'll capture some different part of the audience that's out there that's not an exact science you know what i mean like what you're talking about you're talking about the moment where the guy's making them joe mcphee i think is making the mouth sounds and it's like you can hear a pin drop those are and those moments are like you know like you live for those moments and then you've got other nights where it doesn't entirely come together but to get to the the to get to those moments you have to expose yourself to the risk that the the thurston moore fan at the bar scenario is going to crop up you know what i mean like just i i noticed that 
there's a trend in outsider music writ large to be in more hot pursuit of the more kind of like museumification, like right. um, rarefied kind of setting where where the um, you can hear a pin drop atmosphere is more reliable, but I also feel like that energy that you're describing of, you know, like the empty bottle packed out and you can hear a pin drop is harder to attain in those settings. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Do you, do you <laughs> notice that in the world of out music that there is a kind of increased reliance upon and interest in a more kind of museum type setting? I don't know if I would say that. I mean, I think that there's a, I think there's a diversification of the, the idea of, of, of venues, although I think that's also been there for a long time. And the problem with those kinds of contexts that you're talking about, where you, you know, like, a, let's say a gallery type situation or a museum situation is very often, you can, those are places in which people will be wrapped and super, super quiet for a short while but they also don't, they won't do that necessarily on an ongoing basis. So we, we our concerts at the gallery are, we encourage performers to perform for a half an hour or less because there is this funny thing that happens in those contexts where people suddenly will literally just stand up and start walking around and talking to one another. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of like art opening type thing where people sure. get extremely confused about what the protocols of where they are are. And they're, when they're watching something that they haven't seen before, they'll be really attentive and really quiet. But then they'll just start talking or they'll get, they lose attention. Um, and so it, it, you know, when, when people break, if the piece breaks and then they, uh, people applaud, then it's inevitable in a gallery context that as soon as the applause happens, it's going to be half again as loud after that. It's this is a rule of thumb. So, uh, um, but I don't know. I think I, I think I'm not seeing as many experiments these days with putting uh, experimental and um, improvised music in rock type venues as there were, as was going on in the nineties and early aughts, for sure. I think that's a little bit less, I don't know why, but, and, and, and we're, uh, of course, we're also talking around the big issue right now, which is how will any of that function, uh, into the future? Uh, because I think all of this is so hypothetical right now and, and the shape of, um, the presenting universe after COVID is going to be, uh, is up for grabs for sure. And whether it's going to be hybridized in some way um, with streaming or what, I mean, I, I really don't know, but it will come back and it will be, I think it will be rich again, but it may yeah. be quite different than it has been. Yeah, I mean, I'm in the camp of it's going to come roaring back, but I also recognize that that's like very like highly speculative and like also totally possible that it may not. But while we're on this museum gallery thing, one of the things I want to get to is I want to learn from you about Corbett versus Dempsey. So do sure. you just kind of break down the, I mean, you told us a little bit about it earlier, uh, 04, you were leaving the hardcore music presenting line of work uh yeah. But, but yeah tell us about your motivations and you know what you get at there and just get into it and 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 to be clear too i mean i taught at the school of the art institute to make a living uh while i was presenting because i didn't make any money presenting at zero <laughs> it was not 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 possible if you're presenting you know uh, most of the music that i was presenting i couldn't I would be taking money away from the musicians and I couldn't do that. So I had to have an outside means of support. Um, yeah, and so the gallery really came out of a series of conversations that my partner at the gallery, Jim Dempsey, and I had about the history of uh, the visual arts in Chicago and why we as two like culture vultures knew so little about that history. I mean, Jim was a painter. I was teaching at the art school. 
Um, and we, you know, there weren't a lot of places we could turn. There weren't books that we could turn to unless you got really specialized. You couldn't really get that history. So we started trying to educate ourselves and began to realize, well, a lot of this history is in people's basements and people's um, closets and attics and uh, storage facilities. Um, and that's, that's rich. That's amazing that that's actually as it is. It's such a rich history here and it's different from all of the other histories around the country and around the world. Um, maybe we should try to tell some of that story. So we got involved in doing that. And again, we were doing in 2003 and the beginning of 2004, we were doing independent production together, independent curatorial work. And then finally got frustrated by trying to constantly find new places to do that. And so we brought it all in house. And um, in fact, uh, the guy who runs Dusty Groove Record Store um, is an old friend of mine. And I mentioned to him, I, I said, we were looking for a space. And he said, well, we have a space upstairs. You want to see it? And we said, it's, uh, that's obviously much bigger and nicer than we can afford. And so we went up and looked at it and um, worked out a deal. And that was where our space was until two years ago, uh, was on the third floor of the Dusty Groove building. So we always had this intimate relationship with the music world in, in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Started in 2004, and we were showing a lot of Chicago work uh, for the first four or five years and began to realize we really needed to um, broaden it not show Chicagoans to Chicagoans, but actually begin to think about um, how to uh, diversify what it was that we were showing so that we could, that that would be better for the Chicagoans that we were showing as well. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that, that seemed the most uh, fruitful was to bring people who seemed like they had some affinity here would be well received and but um who had never shown here for one reason or another so we began doing that we brought the artist albert erlin for his first gallery show in chicago um and albert's got a connection to the music scene as well i met him in 1989 for the first time when he had a show at the renaissance society mm -hmm. uh, because he came down did my radio show with me on whpk Mm -hmm. And um, he was a member at the time. He was an on, on and off member of the Red Crayola. Um, mm -hmm. And babes, man. So he was, you know, he was somebody who was uh, good friends with Jim O'Rourke and and with Mayo and all of these folks and David Grubbs, of course, very close friends with David. And I was very close friends with David as well. So we had this kind of inter relationship. All of these different um, people. And so bringing Albert in to show in Chicago, and Albert's, Albert's one of the greatest painters in the world, to bring him here, uh, you know, there were a lot of gallerists scratching their heads saying, why didn't we do that? Mm -hmm. You know, it was a, there were, and there are a lot of people who had just never shown here because it's a smaller gallery infrastructure than a, a great city like this deserves. Um, still is really um, uh, in undeveloped, underdeveloped uh, in uh, gallery infrastructure, commercial gallery infrastructure. Uh, so that, and then we just had opportunities to show amazing people and kind of broaden the scope of what we did. And along the way with Albert and with Christopher Wool and with a variety of people we were showing, we began to realize that the connection to the music part of what we do uh, was not that it wasn't a parallel track and it wasn't a separate thing. It was actually integral to what we were doing with the visual arts. Um, you know, and we're still, we're the only gallery in North America that uh, has shown Peter Brotzman's visual art um, and represents Peter. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's this kind of connection we showed, uh, you know, we had an early on, we had a show called Eye and Ear that actually showed a lot of uh, visual art by uh, artists, artists who were musicians and musicians who were artists. So we, it was a really, really much too big sprawling show, but it had 
you know, a lot of different people in it, ranging from Michael Snow, the great filmmaker and conceptual artist from Canada, um, and a piece that he made in like 1949, uh, which was a portrait of um, Pee Wee Russell, to a painting by Pee Wee Russell, um, to work by, you know, Ikui Mori and, uh, um, and Peter Brotzman, Anthony Braxton, all sorts of different people. Um, and I think that was maybe the fourth show that we had at the gallery. So we were, you know, early on really still thinking about that stuff. I get one last thing to mention about that is that in about 2007, I had a record label before this called the Unheard Music Series. Mm -hmm. And in about 2007, we started bringing things that I had been doing or the energy that I had with that label over to Corbett versus Dempsey and putting out records uh, through the gallery. And so the gallery's record label is now a full fledged um, label. And we put out, uh, I think, 80 or so records of the CDs at this point mm -hmm. and a handful of vinyl. And it's um, going gangbusters. It's great. We've had amazing opportunities. I mean, most recently, a huge um, honor was to get to put out uh, Milford Graves, two Milford Graves records, classic Milford Graves wow. records, um, Bobby and uh, Live at Yale, which was a duet with uh, Don Pullen. Hmm. And that was a product of a 20 year relationship with Milford. Um, and Milford, uh, obviously, two weeks ago, just passed, uh, which was an, an amazing loss and personal loss uh, yeah, yeah. for the gallery and for me. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the gallery is, um, is a whole bunch of different things. You know, I think when we moved spaces two years ago, one of the reasons that we wanted to move to a bigger space was also to be able to think about our archives in a different way, mm -hmm. uh, both the visual art archives and the music archives, and to be able to think about them as an actual archive that people could come. So if somebody wants to study, um, let's say ephemera, like improvised music ephemera from Germany from the 1970s and 60s, late 60s and 70s. We have a pretty good collection of that stuff, some of which is almost unique to us. Somebody could come and spend two or three days looking through that material. Um, and uh, so we have it as a, as a you know, by appointment research facility set up now as well. Um, so it has a little bit of a cultural center um, vibe. I mean, we can't do we can't do that uh, as much as we would want to because um, we're a small team. Mm -hmm. So we have to facilitate it. But it's a big part of what you know what we want to do is make is make these things available. Um, make them. I mean, that's the idea. You know, the basic idea of the gallery, I think, is a, essentially show and tell. Mm -hmm. And so it's about creating opportunities for living artists and for, uh, and, and for curator, us as curators to be able to show work also by um, uh, deceased artists um, that, uh, you know, that, that is putting it out there. Mm -hmm. well, that sounds incredible and it and i'm glad i asked because i'm i'm learning about the breadth of what you do um i i'm interested in understanding a little bit more about the model um you mentioned that you represent peter Bratzman, and that's something that i'm kind of i'm always interested in um art world based models of conducting business uh having worked around the periphery of the art world a lot, you know, mainly as a music programmer, some collaborating with visual artists and so on and so forth. Um, I think that the art world is a very mysterious place to musicians mm -hmm. and it operates along the lines of such a different model in many cases, you know? So I'm always interested to unpack these things. So so you said that you represented Peter Brosman. Is that part of the model? Like you, you're, you're a gallery with artists who you represent? Yeah, I mean, not all, not all galleries work that way. Not, not even not all 
commercial galleries work that way. Yeah, although, no, of course. Um, but but I would say most do mm -hmm. uh, work in, in the way that we do, and we work very conventionally uh, um, as a um, as a gallery. We have an exhibition program, um, and we have a group of artists and artist estates that we represent. And those are those are artists with whom we have ongoing relationships um, as agents, really. Easy, you know, the most the easiest way to think about it is that sure. we're their agents, mm -hmm. and we have a responsibility to them to be thinking about their career, about the. Um, the the safety and provenance of their work mm -hmm. the um um and their legacy and so right. those are you know the in a nutshell those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about um and if we're representing them and if we're the, their primary representation um which we're not in 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 all cases but uh then we end up having additional responsibilities that have to do with keeping their um keeping their records, right? So like making sure everything is photographed, making sure that the that those uh, those high res photographs are accessible um, and are organized, um, keeping records of where things have been sold. And um, in the case that we take on a new artist, um, making sure backfilling some of that information. So basically creating an archive of the artist's uh, working life. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are the things, those are the things that we do, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and, and as such, uh, um, we're out there hustling, um, sometimes making shows here, sometimes making shows elsewhere. Often in the case of the Chicagoans we work with m most actively trying to, trying to find great opportunities for them to show outside of our program. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, so, you know, that's a little, in a, again, in kind of a nutshell, that's what we, that's what we do. Yeah, no, that, that, that's interesting. I'm, I'm, again, I'm glad I'm at, I'm glad I asked. Um, and, um, it, but what's most interesting or what jumps out to me the most is that you've created this analog in an art, fine art context to what you were doing as a presenter. Because when you were listing all of the people that you've worked with, I mean, maybe it's not an exact analog or an exact simulacra, you know, but you're talking about um, all of the people that you've worked with and you had, and you had said that there's this uh, continuing overlap with the music world. And so you've kind of teased this aspect. I mean, even the painting that's behind you, I don't know if that was ever featured in your gallery, but it's like there's this, this striking visual dimension to the kinds of uh, musics that you've historically been interested in. And that seems to me to be at least part of what's informing the work that you're doing at the gallery. Am I correct? Absolutely true. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, to put a point on it, the thing that we, you know, the way that I look at it, um, the musical stuff that we do, I mean, Music is art. So in a certain way, uh, all of these things are part of the art concerns of the gallery, but they take, they require different, uh, um, different resources and different modes of distribution and different, um, and they, and they, and they, you know, they work differently, but at base, I, I'm hesitant to even make a distinction between visual art and music because that suggests that music's not art in a way. You know what I mean? Which I, I think it's better to think of it as all a continuum of cre creative activity. Mm -hmm. um, and that we see ourselves engaging in one way or another. Um, the institutions, I mean, when I was doing, it's not, it's not easy to leap in and out of doing one or the other. You have to learn about those institutions. You have to learn, you know, I, when I, we started with the gallery, I really didn't know how galleries function at all. I mean, we backed our way into it. We backed into it because we had a intellectual pursuit that we were interested in, like this question, why don't we know more about this? Oh, wait a minute, we can find out about it. Let's find out about it firsthand. Let's go interview these people who were here. Yeah, like let's it. go interview these people who were here, who were, you know, who were in school with Joan Mitchell, 
mm -hmm. and who can tell us crazy stories about being with Joan Mitchell at, 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 at Oxbow in Saugatuck um, and find out about their lives and what was going on with them all first person. And, you know, an enormous number of these people are no longer with us, but we've, we've been doing this all along kind of like mm -hmm. uh, that experience. And that's the same thing, you know, having to go back to what we were talking about, you know, being backstage at four o'clock in the morning, hanging out, doing shots with some of your heroes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, a you're sitting and you're hearing stories, you're, you're engaging in oral history in a way that is intensely enriching. And that for me is part of this whole thing. Uh, that, you know, the, um, to get to sit and talk at length with Charlene Von Heil about how she paints, about, you know, about, the way that painting intersects with her life, things like that mm. is an incredible luxury. And I see that as exactly the same mm. as um, having the opportunity to sit and talk strategy with Ken Vandermark about like, you know, how he's thinking about how he's putting his music together and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is a really, important and interesting through line. And uh, I'd li I like I like that about the the describing making those hangs as having this enriching experience of participating in oral history. Absolutely true. I'd never thought about it in quite that light, but that, that is absolutely true and and really interesting. And um, you also say that <clears throat> there there's something about navigating the worlds that kind of get built up around music or get built up around art. There's this at, at, underneath it all, there's this like babbling brook of creativity that unites everything like we know and believe in this, you know what I mean? And then yet somehow in the world, there's these kind of edifices that get constructed around like the division of, you know, the mediums and, and they can kind of generate their own sort of insular um, dynamics and, and sort of have their own codes of the road that have to be learned and, and that translation between one territory and the other is not always exact. I mean, do you, this is, let me just put this out there. This is my experience kind of navigating the art world as a musician is that there's a lot of adaptation that needs to take place. You know, not so much in the territory that you're talking about where it's like, where it's like sheer creativity, just making it, making the hang and listening to a painter talk. It's like, that's very relatable. That flows. Do you know what I mean? But sometimes yeah. just basically being like, hey, could we move this over here? <laughs> like that can be really, that can be really hard. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, in, in some ways, the, the learning experience of getting involved in the, uh, okay, if we think about the two worlds that we're talking about, like the, the, the elephant in the room is that the big difference between these two worlds is money. Okay. And the, in some ways, the learning experience, uh, that, and, and to be more specific about that, like the art world uh, has, there is just more ambient money around, right? <laughs> in the art world, right? Yeah. And there is, in the improvised and experimental music world. Yeah. Like, and I mean, you can see that in terms of like, you know, the number of glossy publications and the, 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 the kind of criticism that's, you know, that, that is uh, generated about, you know, art versus, um, versus uh, out music, let's say. Um, but, what we've sort of been looking at is like how how do we, you know how can you create situations in which um, in which you can apply some of what you know from this one model to the other model, and I think some of the things that when you were talking about like the increasing desire to get into a more museum like scenario for. Um, you know, experimental and improvising musicians. Part of the reason is that there's more money there, sure. and that that money is is not necessarily predicated on how many people come in the door. Absolutely. And um, 
that's a huge difference. And that's a, that's a difference that takes stress off of a lot of different things. So um, for, that's part of the draw there. And that's not, that's not as obvious as it seems. Like it, you, know, you say, oh, well, there's more money over there. But on the other hand, there are a lot of gatekeepers over there too. Mm -hmm. So you're also sort of like figuring out how do you navigate this? How do you create a situation in which you can put this in almost inherently fascinating material in front of people who are ready to be fascinated? Uh, that's, that's the job. And then how can you tap into, or at least until hopefully, hopefully all of our cultural institutions won't be so decimated after all of this is over that we, that this is a joke, what I'm saying right now. <laughs> you can actually, you know, you can actually imagine that there would be some money there to, to pay people sure. and, that, and that that money would be well spent for that institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it makes sense. It's it's a totally, uh, it's a totally legitimate um, ambition, and it's one that I was in possession of for decades of my life. Do you know what I mean? And and couldn't yeah. crack that nut until I did, and then I was like, hmm. So this is how this works. But but um, but my, my if I were to wage a critique of the strategy, it would have less to do with getting into the art world and getting into a museum and, and doing something meaningful and, and actually getting paid. That, that all makes perfect sense. It's more that I find um, when I was talking earlier about museumification, I, I maybe I wasn't being terribly clear. I also um, in the context of, of what I feel I notice in um, out music uh, with that museum museumification can come a kind of silo in right mm -hmm. so i was i was referencing that in like contradistinction to the types of environments that you were describing at the empty bottle and what i felt like i noticed from afar transpiring at the em empty bottle where there could be this kind of like cross-pollinating and these like yes I see what you mean yes and i agree with that and i've observed that too i i i think that's which is ironic because those you know those contexts are ones in which that music is certainly being presented as if it's like, you know, genre, but it's very often being talked about in terms of like how it crosses genre or a coffee and it's like, whatever, but it is, I see what you mean. Like, yeah, it definitely isn't, it, it doesn't necessarily have, yeah, depending on what kind of context, you know. Depends uh, on the curator, a lot of the Depends time. on who's, yeah, who's, who's looking at it. I mean, you know, the Art Institute, I did a little series there for about a year. I did a series called Extensions Out, which was the, uh, a series of bringing musicians. We brought Moreno Veloso in and, um, uh, and uh, Tamika Reed Quartet with Mary Halverson. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm blanking on what else we did. We did about four concerts. And, um, and it was great. And they, but they've, they have a program as well that like came out of that, that was amazing that they've been doing all of this stuff. Peter Margusak put this incredible um, series of, well, he, he does an amazing concert series at Constellation here in Chicago. Great place. Um, contemporary classical music or contemporary music. Um, and, you know, they presented that there. Uh, I think one of the things that came out of the bottle experience for us, you know, was a proliferation here. And it was going on uh, toward the middle of the bottle, empty bottle experience. There was a proliferation of venues in Chicago. Um, and, and after all of that, eventually Constellation came and, and really established a venue in which all of the kinds of things that we've been talking about and we've been, you know, that had been part of the lifeblood of our, our imagined universe here began to be a reality um, uh, where you could have all sorts of different kinds of music coming to this one venue. But I mean, the, you know, the Hungry Brain was an amazing venue that was going on at the same time. And Mike Reed, who started Constellation, was one of the two people who started that with Josh Berman. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Dave Rempus started Elastic, and has been a running elastic, uh, you know, for, I, I'm not actually, he had 
2020 before that, which was another, um, another venue. So there have been all of these spaces, you just sort of started to see all of these spaces come up that had that were uh, around for a long while and have, uh, in this case, long exceeded the, the, the tenure of the bottle and have done lots more than we were able to do in that 10 year run. Mm -hmm. um, having, you know, I think expanded the, the different kinds of ways that music could be pervaded, uh, presented and, and understood here, you know, ranging from the, from the hungry, the quite a casual context at the hungry brain, mm -hmm. um, you know, much more of a bar like context mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, ranging from that to a, a more of a cultural center type venue, like elastic where, you know, really it was a foundation and it's really set up to be a place with, you know, folding chairs and people sitting quietly watching the music. Um, so I, it's been great seeing that, you know, kind of um, evolve and then eventually kind of like be these become institutions here mm -hmm. in the same way that the Velvet Lounge was an institution for uh, a very long time, starting in 1985 um, in Chicago when Fred Anderson was, you know, here to run it. Mm -hmm. um, really as a, a all com again, completely different kind of venue, a venue that had a, an, a weekly um, jam session where people would come in from the South Side community to um, basically to get on stage sometimes for the first time and really try things out. And so it had a very different community vibe from a lot of these other venues that are a little bit more along the uh, lines of um, a straight up um, club, mm -hmm. you know? So, and then, and, and to, to add one more to that list, I'll just say, you know, a, a place that I spent a lot of time, again, with the jam session vibe, Mm -hmm. uh, was um, the new apartment lounge, which I think was an enormous... that one. That's the that first was, one I don't know. That was a big loss for us. That was where Von Freeman had his weekly Tuesday night concerts. And he would play a single set and then uh, no break. He would start filtering musicians from the room into the uh, on stage. Well, there wasn't really a stage. <laughs> it was on the floor of Area. the bar. <laughs> into his area exactly into the shag carpeted area of the bar and that was an amazing amazing thing to go to um and see week in week out so you could go there and it would be packed or you could go there there would be three people there Love and that. it didn't matter von freeman played with the same utmost seriousness uh no matter what man i love i love hearing about all these spaces in rapid fire i mean most of those spaces i know and have been to or played at um one of the ones that you mentioned the one that the person who opened elastic had before elastic 2020 i think you said 2020 yeah yeah that one i i i, I knew of but had never been to but all the rest of them i had been to and i just love having this like evoked in rapid succession it's really a, a deep thing but I'm gonna. You're you're a you're a fascinating guy, and it's easy to kind of stay in a lane. But I'm gonna pivot, and I'm gonna do it by referring to something that you said when we were talking about museumification and siloing, and we were talking about how it's interesting that there can be this siloing around this music that has this kind of genre busting or you know trans transcends genre kind of profile, and that brings me back to the introduction of the book that you wrote and sent to me which I referenced at the very beginning of our talk and said that I was going to bring up. So here we are. And um, you, I actually wrote this down. You say in that, um, <clears throat> uh, you say in that introduction, improvised music was one of the first committed, excuse me, improvised music was one of the first committedly international art forms in which people from far flung communities sought to collaborate. Okay, just a little quote there. And when I was reading, throughout reading the, the uh, introduction that you sent me, um, I wanted to ask you, and I'm now going to ask you, how you feel the um, culture of collaboration that has arisen around the internet has informed um, communities of practice within improvised music uh, in, ter in, in terms of collaboration, specifically in terms of these kind of this kind of energy of people from far-flung places collaborating, um, yeah. 
and you all because because the thing that really brought this up for me and made me want to ask you this is because you also talk about how the kind of early history of improvised music um that you know that that you're a part of um was dominantly regional mm -hmm. do you know what i mean so you go from this kind of regionality to this kind of commitment to you know transcultural trans geographic collaboration and then at some point enter the internet which kind of claims all of those things as it's sort of you know kind of waves that flag but i'm just curious to hear what you think about how those things cross pollinate or inform each other or whether they do or not or so on however you want to take it it's interesting you know i'll relate it back to um my activity presenting music first first of all just to say you know pre pre-internet um it's it's almost hard to imagine how we did what we did pre-internet, right? It, and it and it the it was only possible because we had um, answering machines, and because we had answering machines that would be full every day when we would get home. So you get home and there'd be like thirty six messages, and you'd have to listen through them. And sometimes it was the same person leaving con contradictory messages, telling you where something was coming from, or there's a package land, whatever. You know, it was just it was just a deluge of information, but in, in a form that was ready to be exchanged the way we do with the internet, but it didn't have the means yet, right? And I think what's, what's interesting to me about that is that that was the revving up of a certain thing that, has, that I look at now um, with the benefit of a year of having had it slow, slowed down. And I realized that that was a kind of speeding up process that's been going on now since the beginning of the internet uh, that the, the cultural world was ready for, right? It was like going gangbusters, it's kind of like, okay, let's try and make all of these different things happen. And for me, that registered in a transnational way, right? Like I was interested in trying to create opportunities to bring musicians to Chicago uh, to play with Chicagoans or to meet them so that they might become interested in them and invite them someplace else to play, right? So eventually Mats Gustafsson and I did this project called Pipeline, uh, Pipeline 2000 in the year 2000, when we set up a big band that was made up of um, eight musicians from Chicago and eight musicians from mostly Sweden. And we did that in Sweden and we toured it in Sweden. And then we did it here in Chicago and we did it at a bunch of different venues. And that kind of process of like creating these conduits for people to be able to learn about one another and to do it in a, not in a superficial way, but so that they would actually organically begin to you know, figure out who they really had an affinity for. And often the people I thought would have an affinity weren't the ones that would have an affinity and they would come and that didn't really work, but they met somebody else or whatever. So that kind of thing of coming together, that was so sped up and maniacally facilitated. That had already been going, but then when the internet became a re really major part of the whole process, it was like a tidal wave. And I remember having a kind of a coffee date with Vandermark um, not too long before the pandemic. And it was just after he came back from, um, from his from a tour of um, Japan, I think it was his first time being in Japan. Oh, really? And he was so turned on by that experience mm -hmm. and by the by all of the possibilities that were latent mm -hmm. in that experience. So here's a classic transnational situation, right? He goes there. He has he meets all these people. He's seeing all of this stuff. He's sees what this environment is like, it's turning him on. It's just incredible. And I can see that this is, you know, because of the ease of the internet, now he can just uh, email, he can just basically be in touch with any of these people and 
start creating opportunities to do all of these things. All of that is, all of that's amazing. It's wonderful. But let's go back to the thing that we were talking about really early, which has to do with like the physical limits of the body mm -hmm. and the physical limits of our attention and our psyche. And I think that that speeding up process that we're talking about, there's, an, there's something to be said for um, also really soaking in an experience really allowing it to deeply influence you. And, and the crazy kind of speed that I feel like that this world that we're talking about has turned into, has created, um, was making it difficult to really deeply engage with those things, even the ones that we felt so strongly about. It. And I think this is, a, this is an issue um, that has that's you know so maybe I'm taking it in a slightly different way from how you meant it, but that's I'm good. I'm really interested in the question of speed mm. and the question of the speed of life and how that relates to the experience of um, touring, playing, presenting, listening to, engaging with improvised music. Mm. To me, and this is the experience of this last. 11 months, whatever. And I say that after having taken, I mean, it really like slowed down a year before that. I had some health issues that kind of just came in and um, knocked the wind out of me and made me slow down. And so I've had about a two year period here where I really cranked what had been a crazy schedule down a notch or two or 10. Um, and to me, it's really, really interesting. So when I think about the, when I think about those, you know, let's go back to 1968 when Peter Brotzman did Machine Gun. And that's a notable record because it begins to invite, it's where people, it's not the first place that this happens, but it's, he's making a point of incorporating people from, London, people from Belgium, people from Germany, a uh, guy from Sweden, all together, right, in this band. And uh, that, you know, that was predicated on these, exper on these relationships that took a long time to develop. Um, they, were, they were developing for a period up till then that he was then sort of uh, that he had cultivated and that he was then, um, he was culminating, he was bringing them together. So I feel like, and that had to be done all analog, that had to be done all with letters and phone calls. And so the speed at which those things proceeded was so different from the speed at which someone can just be in touch now and say, hey, man, I've been listening to your records. I really like what you're doing. Um, I'm going to be coming through town. You know, let's get together. How about we do a gig? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That kind of instant instantaneousness. Mm -hmm. And that kind of instantaneousness is detrimental, essentially, or can be. I think it, I don't think it is essentially but I think it can be. And I think if that's the norm or that's actually the only way things happen, that can be a problem. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, or if you, even if you're engaged, you're like doing something that you really love, that you really want to be doing, you're playing with people you really want to be playing, mm -hmm. but you have taken, it's so easy, you know, doing this to pull so many things onto your plate in terms of projects, in terms of mm -hmm. um, playing opportunities. Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I'm just looking around, I'm seeing all of these musicians really, really excited to play and not bitching about having had, about being exhausted because they've been touring too much or, um, you know, not taking anything for granted. Suddenly we're back at that place. Mm. You know what I mean? Like suddenly yeah. we're there. Yeah. Like, Oh my God, anything that you do right now is an amazing opportunity. Yeah.
Yeah, that is true. That is true. So that I, I would tend to agree, but that's interesting and well put. Um, man, you just reminded me of Peter Brotsman's machine gun, which I'm going to go home and put on. Um, <laughs> but um, a, another thing that I would tease out of, or the, of the internet and the, and the improvised music conversation, and I had never thought about this until I read what you sent me, and that is that things like, you know, things like what you're describing when you're saying it's an early community committedly seeking to collaborate across these kind of divides, right? So you have like the Derek Bailey record with the, the Koto player whose, whose name escapes me, uh, you know, John Zorn and the guys from Napalm Death, right? You know what I mean? Like th th this kind of like, there was this moment where it felt like this methodology can just contain anything. If people come to it with the intention, with, with authentic intention to make something worthwhile, you know, they're not coming out of some kind of cynicism or something, you know what I mean? They really want sure. to be make in a music making uh, environment with somebody. There's something about the methodology that can hold almost anything. That sensibility has become, right? Like at the time it was at this kind of extraordinary outlier, very esoteric, right? But the sort of DNA of that sensibility has become almost a pop aesthetic. You understand right. what I mean? Like improvised music in, in from that era in, in some way, unwittingly, I'm sure, mm -hmm. is kind of proto this thing that you now see around you all the time, which is, which is of course expedited and enabled and facilitated by at the speed of light, you can be here or you can be there. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Like this kind of yep. logic that gets folded in, in with like capitalist consumerism ends up at this place that is in a very kind of base and crass way doing what, what free improvised was, free improvised music was doing in a very authentic and earnest way you know, 50 years ago. Right. <laughs> Do you understand right. what I'm saying? Right. Like, right. Well, and I mean, you know, uh, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I think that the, the idea, I mean, I, I always go back to this one line. George Carlin had this great line about, um, like the great thing about, uh, uh, about living in America is that, um, if there's anything, two things that have never been nailed together, some schmuck will nail them together and try and sell it, right? Like that's the basic <laughs> idea. And I think that's like the basic accretive uh, mindset of so many Americans, uh, which has to do with like genre mixing and stuff like that. It can be done in that very kind of like slightly, you know, uh, ugh like way of like, okay, oh, do, let's take this music and that music. And you think about all of the hyphenations mm -hmm. in music going way back, like, you know, uh, you know, uh, goth metal or whatever, like any two genres that you can ever imagine, you can just put a hyphen between them and then you have a new genre, right? So it's that basic, very sort of stupid idea of, uh, of a kind of paint by numbers universe of music mm -hmm. that you just put together. Mm -hmm. uh, but but out of that can come some amazing things and out of it can also be a complete contrivance that's commercial or is just plain stupid. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go back to like, if we look at some of the things that were going on at that same time as like Brotzman was doing um, Machine Gun and you think about like a Pied Piper like character, mm -hmm. <clears throat> like Don Cherry. Mm -hmm. who's uh, peripatetic. He's kind of moving all around Europe and coming back to the States. And, and he's everywhere he goes, he's gathering different people to play with. He's in Turkey. He's playing with Turkish musicians. He's moving them into Sweden. He's in Sweden. He's playing with Swedes. He's going and he's, mm -hmm. he's playing with all these different people, bringing them together and really creating, you know, this, he's interested in this kind of universal consciousness idea this something that's about bringing people together about forgetting nationalisms about forgetting cultural uh distinction as a dividing line and instead thinking of it as something that can be um brought, brought together and not like you say not in a cynical way and not in a simple-minded way like understanding that there's also 
tension there and that there's uh, and that there's uh, a fraught quality that can come out of that as well. Mm. I think that's incredibly, you know, and those, those are very different. If you think of machine gun on the one hand, which incidentally was what, I mean, Peter Bertzman called machine gun machine gun because that was Don Cherry's nickname for him. Mm. Right. And then you have the Don Cherry approach, which is a totally different approach. Mm. So you have these two, two kind of ideas about transnationalism mm. that are, um, that are, complementary, but are super different from one another. And um, I think that's really interesting. I mean, you look at the, the, at the mid 1960s as this place, as this period when there's just all of this, and it's, I mean, you know, travel, we, you can look at all sorts of uh, underlying reasons that that starts to rise then. I mean, you get fluxus, which precurses improvised music as a transnational art form, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, that's coming up in the early 60s, right? Mm -hmm. Part of the reason that that stuff's starting to happen is that, is that air travel is cheaper. And so people are able to travel around a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But I came into improvised music, you know, as a presenter in the 80s, and it was still pretty difficult, I mean, for Europeans to come to the States and almost impossible for Americans to go there unless they were going to stay there for a little while, like the art ensemble did in 1969-70, mm -hmm. um, or most of the AACM did at, in that period. Um, so uh, it's really interesting to me, you know, like that you see like the walls come down on one side and you start to see an international flowering of an internationalism in, <clears throat> in improvised music, but it, it still takes quite a while to actually get to a place where in the 90s, you know, I think we there was one year that Mats Gustafsson came to Chicago uh, like 10 times, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think those days are totally over. I mean, we can't, you know, that, what is it gonna be like? I mean, how expensive is it gonna be to fly? Mm. Yeah, it could go either way. It could go either way, you know, it's a, that's a weird one. Um, yeah, no, I'm hearing you. I mean, one thing in having this, discussion about the impetus toward or the excuse me the impulse toward this kind of collaboration in the context of improvised music uh and then and then like re this sort of brash pop aesthetic that i'm talking about that does in some crass way seem to have internalized you know something that is identifiable uh, in that impulse um but one thing about improvised music and free jazz that is just really stunning if you think about it is that it persists and it's strong and it's really never like dipped you know i mean it's something that's never exactly in favor but it's never like dipped from where it is and it has completely resisted commercialization of any kind do you know what i mean i, I would that, say that is totally true yes you can't actually say that even about things that you'd think you'd be able to say that about, right? Like, like even noise music or industrial music, or there's some peninsula that comes out of it that somehow achieves, has some moment and, you know, it becomes a thing. And this, this stuff has just been like in this lane, kind of like most people are like, whoa, why are you doing that? You know, but like with the people who are, you know, in it, it just, it's just a, like a plane of consistency and, and, and has this uh, and has this ability to just dodge capitalist devices of capture and desire and consumption, which is like an accomplishment. I mean, it's incredible. Totally. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, the place we thought that was happening was with Zorn in the eighties, and you know, there was I can moment. see that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll say for sure, like from the standpoint of someone, you know. Uh, the organization I worked with presented Zorn and Butch Morris in must have been like 83 or 84 uh, at a little place in Providence, Rhode Island, and at a, at a museum, in fact. Um, and uh, we, uh, and it must have been maybe two years later that that whole, that Zorn sort of like blew up, right, and started to become extremely uh, extremely popular and well-known and to get what we saw as a kind of 
pop, um, a, a kind of pop uh, acclaim. Um, and then came a whole set of debates about um, what that meant and you know whether that was a problem or whether that was a salvation or would that mean that there were great opportunities for other musicians mm. that he was and and John Zorn has done you know has done so much in terms of creating opportunities for other musicians through his label through a whole variety of things mm. very outwardly looking in terms of all of that from a production standpoint absolutely um, I think he made really good on all of those um, things that at that point there was this kind of precariousness of like is improvised music selling out um, and but you can take that back you know what's funny about the mid 60s or the, let's say the late 60s uh, is that there was a, it was a moment in the record industry where and in the music industry in a larger sense where you had a lot of older people who really couldn't quite still couldn't quite get their head around what was going on with psychedelic rock and with the things that were at that point very popular and there were label there were big labels major labels that were experimenting with improvised music and i mean full-on straight up whole, no holds barred improvised music like give me an example out, like Tony Oxley has uh, records on uh, RCA and CBS, right? In that period. Totally insane, like unbelievably ferocious records. They're great records, incredibly great records. So, and that happened in that period. And you know, it happened again uh, in, in the eighties where there was an experimentation like RCA for instance, had a whole series. Uh, and AM records put out a Cecil Taylor record, put out Sun, two Sun Ra records, mm -hmm. right? And they would sort of dip in and they'd say, like, is this actually going to be the next big thing? Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's kind of a lot of hoopla around it. Maybe we should try it again. Yeah. And well, so every I time there is a, um, like a, uh, a, a kind of like plate shift in the sort of constitution of cultural ground, there's this kind of like, scramble where everyone's like who knows what i mean i experienced this you know in the industry of you know the kind of club operation kind of lane that i'm in uh, i felt like i experienced this in the industry when COVID happened nobody knew what was going to happen nobody knew what to do there were like a few sure. standard kind of oh let's do this kind of moves but people were like very open here's what i'm trying to say i noticed that some of the people in the more industry kind of sides of things that I deal with were unusually receptive to far out ideas. Yeah. yeah. Because when things change, people are like, well, who knows? Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. This is exactly it. I, exactly. And I think that's such an interesting thing to see these kind of moments where people are sort of like, it, and it doesn't work, right? It hasn't worked. It hasn't been, but you know, like, Brotherhood of Breath made a record for RCA, for Neon, which was, uh, and I'm look at, you know, uh, Spontaneous Music Ensemble made a record for Island Records. Like, you, you go through this list and you start to look at all of these major labels that were actually experimenting with, with real improvised music. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, imagine what that would mean from a contemporary perspective. Like, it, mm -hmm. it, it would be a big surprise. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, uh, yeah, I think about that all the time. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but like I think about that all the time because even Electra Nunsuch, which is in a sense kind of devoted to doing something interesting, so it sort of makes sense that they would have, you know, Kronos Quartet and John Zorn and whomever else, right? Still, those people, like if like if you if Lori Anderson was a 27-year-old and made weird science today, it would be on some minor indie. Do you know what oh. I mean? There's no yeah. chance it would be on like Matador or so. You know what I'm saying? It's just like zero. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there are these moments where like the weird intercepts the uh, thing. I would say about John Zorn is that uh, I've all I've always I mean John Zorn huge important person to me. I, I mean not even so much because I 
I'm that into the music more just as like a model of like a kind of person you can be in the world. Do you know what I mean? Like sure. just everything he pulled together it, it, as a practice is just like astonishing and amazing. And like, I, I've always been blown away by it. I never would have put him in the like lane of like, like to me, John Zorn isn't like a really successful Evan Parker or something. As you follow what I'm saying, he's just like, he's just like, something totally else not that he doesn't engage part of what the those improvisers or american improvisers engage that that's like a a part of something that's like in his palette you know what i mean but i think of him as like a conceptual artist or something and i and i actually think about like his level of success as being sort of somehow specifically part of his art like making the ennio morricone record i mean that's just a brilliant that was like a brilliant thing to do Right. You know what I mean? Just the idea, just to have that idea. Like, I'm going to take this music that everybody knows because in all these famous movies, and I'm going to do it with like Vernon Reed and like I'm going to play this yeah. wild shit on it. Like, that's like an insane and kind of brilliant, just like conceptual art piece. You know what I'm sure. saying? Like, anyways, now I'm just riffing on Zorn. Sorry. But, but, and it was a conceptual conceit that Hal Wilner had and made good on with the with with Amor Cordina Rota and um and his monk tribute and those records and Zorn played on uh, at least he played on the monk record I'm not sure if he was on I think he was on other records as well of Hal's um so there was a there was a tradition of those kinds of things of having and and even soundtrack right I mean that Neo Morricone record came I think five years after um, after Amacord Nina Rota. And Amacord Nina Rota was all Nina Rota compositions, like film score compositions for Fellini, that, um, that, and it was the first place that Bill Frizzell, first recording of Bill Frizzell is on that record, you yeah. know? Hey. And so those, there's these real, you know, I think that was something that was definitely in the air. What, to me, you know, we looked at, Zorn as being one of the great figures of the downtown music scene, right? <clears throat> um, which to us was this place, this confluence of the no wave scene and a certain kind of very, like, you know, very specific improvised music. And, um, and so Zorn was a, a figure who sort of meant that to me, like, uh, and, and so Zorn's, there was that, just that moment when he suddenly acquired a, you know, um, an international public presence that was so different from what we were used to. Um, now, you know, there have been a number of improvisers who have had that kind of a, um, that kind of a, a presence. Um, and we have, we have different kinds of venues from what we had at that point, I think. So that with the internet, all of those things have changed in terms of how those musics relate to their, the publicity uh, angle, the publicity side of what they do. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with you at core that improvised music is a very difficult thing to uh, commodify. That's just the, because as soon as you commodify it, you take away what's really, what gives it its juice. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. And it's really boring right away. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even just making a recording of it is, although I find that a fascinating process and I love recordings of improvised music, live improvised music is always superior. Mm -hmm and always has more juice. So even in that step, which is the basic step of like, as you say, capturing it, right? Like you've already done something that slightly denatures it. Mm -hmm. And I think anything that you do beyond that, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't know, it's, uh, Derek Bailey, had, he, he had this great line I interviewed him for the first time in 1985 and he had this amazing line um, most music, I, I can almost remember it by, uh, uh, just remember it by rote. Most music rides in on a tidal wave of hyperbole and bullshit. 
<laughs> and I knew he was setting that against the music that he made. Um, and I and I heard that and I thought, God, that is so, it's just so simple and it's so perceptive because really it's true that uh, as soon as you start making those kind of hyperbolic statements about music, about something that you're doing, you're, um, you're creating something aside from what it really is. Mm -hmm. And it, you're creating this little mythology around it. And improvised music has been peculiarly, peculiarly resistant to those kinds of mythologies. Mm -hmm. Word. Uh, which is what's, which is one of the things that's really interesting to me about it. Great. Uh, John, we're, we're, we're hitting the two hour mark, man. I told you it might happen. It. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I want to, that's a really, this, this kind of um, reflection about the um, power of improvised music, I think is a, a, a good leaving off point, but I want you, before you go, tell us about the things that you've been doing in the last few days, these things that you have coming up vis-a-vis uh, -vis Sun Ra, et cetera. Okay, I'll just mention a couple of them, and also it's good to talk about power because my power is almost gone. So it's this is yeah. timing is perfect here. Um, the gallery has uh, recently become the um, speaking of representation. We represent the non-music side of the Sun Ra estate, and uh, this is a fairly new uh, arrangement. It's really exciting for us. Uh, it doesn't. It's not a matter of selling anything out of an estate that's it, instead it's about um uh helping when museums have shows or when when uh Ra's being represented in one way or another helping make sure that that's done in a historically accurate way in a respectful way and a way that advances the ball um so we've put out four books of sun Ra poetry um, in facsimile editions, the way that they were originally published. This is uh, Extensions Out, The Immeasurable of e e Equation, Volume 2, that was published in 1972 uh, in this beautiful kind of um, uh, very 70s manner with this kind of textured paper. So we've done that. We've done uh, two sets of liner note poems. These are uh, this was his first record that came out on transition, and he was interested in disseminating his poetry by unorthodox means, including putting little booklets of them in his records. So this is one, and then another one called Jazz and Silhouette, which was a record um, from 1959, and uh, a little mimeographed sheet of poems was inserted into the very first copies of that, so we have that, and the fourth one is The Immeasurable Equation, which was his best known book of poetry, um, all in facsimile editions. Those go, they drop, as they say, uh, <laughs> tomorrow on our website. Amazing. Um, and so we're very excited. They're being sold as a package, uh, four books. Super excited for them to be uh, out in the world. Cool. Well, um, I'm going to check that out. Uh, John, this is a this is an amazing uh, first ever conversation, and um, I'm really happy to to go on these uh, deep dives with you, man. I learned a lot. Super fun, Sam. So great. Thank you for doing this, and thank you for this great uh, yeah, this great place of assembly. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, hundred percent, man. I'm I'm here for it. So uh, I'll, I'll drop you a line sometime, man. We'll be in touch. Okay, sounds good. All right, man. Cheers. Right on. Bye. Okay. Boom, John Corbett. There you have it. This dude is a legend, man. Um, the weekly series at the Empty Bottle alone is a legendary status, uh, epic impact on Chicago scene, uh, something that I was aware of from a very young age. Um, first time meeting the dude, man. Really, uh, really, really cool to uh, link up with this guy. I, I, I always heard about John Corbett, um, aware of some things, but it was uh, heavy to unpack everything that this guy's about. Gallery, operator, label head, curator, event-based worker, teacher, writer. Um, yeah, man. Uh, prodigious, prolific, um, respect. So, place of assembly, 
uh thanks for joining us new format you know trying something out um next week uh well i should say this whole series is going to be uh dominated by mini series within the series um focusing on geographic locations starting next week we have a four-part series with a, an esteemed co-host melissa alcatra mayor of basilica hudson incredible space in hudson new york also fun fact uh original bass player and whole bass player in the smashing pumpkins uh has had quite a time fascinating woman um, excited to build with her that starts next week and we're going to be looking at uh, different spaces in upstate New York and uh, the uh, creative arts emergence upstate so uh, come back build with us about that if you like what you see here get at us uh, Instagram hollow.nyc I'm on Instagram diamond terrifier and uh, support us Patreon, uh, patreon.com forward slash hollow. Hollow is spelled H zero L zero. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, shout at us, uh, support us and uh, come check us out next Monday. Um, all right. A tendency to building castles in the air. <laughs>